the spirit of reconciliation, I pay my respects to the people of the Darug and the Gundagara nations on whose land we sit, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Well, welcome back to another conversation in the Bishop Vincent Presents uh, series to start this final year on the uh, Synod on Synodality. So it's a big moment in the life of the church. Now, you might remember this time last year, we welcomed Sister Natalie Beckhart to uh, uh, join us ahead of the Continental Assembly in Oceania. And now it's my great pleasure to welcome Monsignor Tomas Halik, the renowned Czech theologian, whose opening address to Europe's Continental Assembly in Prague last year set out uh, an agenda for a synodal church that is very exciting and, and uh, challenging and demanding and where we might be headed next. And I think it'll be marvellous to hear him outline this further. Joining us also is our own Australian Jesuit Father Frank Brennan, who uh, to offer his reflections on what happens next from our view here in Australia. So welcome to you both. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, now, um, uh, Monsignor Thomas, uh, Monsignor, oh, yeah, Monsignor. Thomas. Yeah. <laughs> Thomas, your new book, The Afternoon of Christianity, uh, you appeal in it for a transition from the wreckage of the morning of Christianity to a more mature afternoon form. Now, look, that is, <laughs> that is a very arresting invitation. Do please go on. Okay, uh, so this is my uh, book, uh, The Afternoon of Christianity, uh, was inspired by the um, idea of uh, Carl Gustav Jung, the founder of the depth uh, psychology. The human life is like a day. Uh, the childhood uh, is uh, the morning, then, um, uh, then uh, normally uh, comes uh, the midday crisis, midlife crisis. And after uh, the afternoon of life is the time for uh, more maturity to go deeper. And uh, I applied this uh, metaphor uh, uh, to the uh, history of Christianity. So morning is a pre-modern time, time for building the uh, doctrinal structures, the institutional structures of church. And then came the midday crisis, the modernity, uh, enlightenment, uh, uh, atheism, uh, time for shaking uh, of these uh, structures. And I think uh, this crisis, uh, it's uh, till now, uh, for example, the, cri uh, the uh, abuse uh, scandals mm -hmm. was also uh, part of uh, this uh, midday crisis. But after the crisis, uh, there's a possibility to go deeper. And, uh, to, uh, and I think we are now at the threshold of the afternoon of Christianity. The afternoon could be also uh, the uh, bad afternoon. Uh, somebody uh, would uh, like to continue just in uh, what was before. Uh, yeah. But um, uh, it is a new challenge, it is a new possibility. So the aging, yes. the afternoon aging, uh, could be the bad aging, uh, just the nostalgia for, for, for the past and, and, and uh, to be rigid, but there's also the possibility to go deeper, to develop the depth dimension of uh, religion, which is spirituality. So I think uh, this uh, call of Pope Francis to synodal reform is a very important moment in the history of the church. It is, or may be, uh, the beginning of this afternoon of Christianity. Uh, if it would be accepted in the church, I think the Pope uh, gave us uh, the great impulses, inspirations, but it is our task to reflect it more deeper and to put it in practice, of course. Now, some might say, well, afternoon is followed by evening, which is typically sort of, you know, in, in yeah. the metaphor is sort of a decline 
But you okay. don't see it like that, I, do you? Uh, so I say this last um, uh, sentence of this, my book, uh, and I'm saying, yeah, the, uh, the evening in the Hebrew um, uh, model of, of, of a day of time is the beginning of the new day. When the first star is, uh, it is the beginning of a new day. So the evening is not the end, but it is uh, the beginning of the new era. And we should be prepared for this new era. And this afternoon is the preparation for something. And there is this possibility uh, for this good aging, for more wisdom, uh, more depths, and, and so on. Um, is it a death and resurrection experience a bit you're talking about? Yes, yes. I, I think uh, there's another uh, there's another model we can use, and this is the mystery of Easter. Uh, so um, I think that the, the event of Christ is continuing in the history. There is the um, not only the uh, creatio continua, it is the def definition by the uh, St. Augustine said, uh, to pray, it means to close your eyes and imagine that God is crea uh, creates the world now. And I think there is not only this uh, uh, creatio continua, this continuing creation, but also the uh, continuing of incarnation, of uh, passion of the of the crux uh, of, uh, of the cross and also uh, the resurrectio continua the continuo resurrection so the resurrection yes it's a great event in the history of salvation but it is not closed it's going on and i think to to to, to believe and to believe in resurrection it means open our eyes open our heart and say Christ is risen now. Christ uh, lives in our faith. Christ lives in our church. Uh, Christ. And um, I uh, love uh, this uh, scene uh, from uh, the gospel, uh, the women by the tomb, empty tomb. And they uh, listen, uh, the voice from heaven, why uh, do you seek uh, the living um, uh, in the uh, um, by the dead. Mm. He is not here. He is uh, uh, risen and he is in Galilee. Go to Galilee and to find him. And I think we have the task to seek the Galilee of today. So uh, the, uh, the space, the place where we can meet the resurrected Christ today. Because the resurrected Christ, the resurrection is not just the reanimation of, of the dead body. It is a transi transition, transformation. Uh, even the uh, nearest and dearest of Jesus Christ uh, were not able to recognize him uh, when he came again. So Mary Magdalene, so he's a garden. And, so, and I think that Jesus Christ is coming to us uh, in, uh, in the transformation many transforming form and our task is to see him and uh, to, that uh, the Christian existence is the adventure of seeking and finding Christ in uh, very different new transformations also outside the church we should go outside of our uh, institutional structure and our mental structure uh, perhaps in the space uh, where uh, these nuns are the people they the nuns uh, uh, yes uh, um, the, the sense of the, the growing numbers who, who are no yeah. believers look um this is interesting so the galilee you describe am i right in imagining that it's the the great unwashed <laughs> as it, we, we say in australia the sort of the secular world I, 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 is that what you mean the sort of people yeah. where it, it might be indifference rather yeah, than yeah, atheism yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so i think uh, in this uh, in this very important uh, moment not only of the history of the church but also in the history of our civilization uh, there are many wars 
fail, not only the Berlin Wall, but also the wall uh, between the believers and non-believers. I think they are now uh, not the separated groups of people. Uh, the, the dialogue between faith and unbelief is inside of uh, the soul of many people. So many people so you think are there's today a search on, a search on much more yes, than we yes. recognize. I think uh, that uh, the a number of people they are uh, fully identified with the churches and the organized religion is diminishing. But also the dogmatic atheists, the number of the dogmatic atheists, I think, is diminishing. And there are so many people. So the belief and unbelief, it is so colorful uh, spectrum. And there are some people, um, they have this dialogue between belief and unbelief in their own soul. And I think it's a very interesting dialogue because sometimes the doubts and faith are like the two sisters. They need each other. So the faith without the critical questions, without doubts, could be fanaticism, fundamentalism, uh, bigotry, but also the doubts without uh, the fundamental, uh, yes, this ontological trust in the, in the trust in the ontological mystery how to say it that is this uh, uh, this basic trust um, this um, uh, deep dimension of of of, of, of religiosity yeah uh, you think so 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 you think that is still there that's mm. that very much that quest for meaning and what what's yeah. it all about it's yeah. there but it's not expressed yes. necessarily yeah. Yeah. in yeah. the yeah. usual yeah. ways mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's what you because, mean yeah yeah, yeah. There's a great interest in, 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 in uh, spirituality and uh, the people are seeking for some way how to communicate with this uh, mis absolute mystery. Ne? And uh, uh, churches are sometimes not able to offer the understable uh, way uh, to open the door for, for those seekers. And uh, I think it's very important uh, to, to, to open the door for, the, for, 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 for seekers. Now, I noticed be before I, w I go to see how Father Frank might, w we might apply that to Australia, you're quite interesting about saying, in effect, the world of atheism, which, you know, the church is yeah, the norm of yeah, the atheists, yeah, yeah, so yeah, the big yeah, worry. Yeah. Uh, you're saying, I think you're saying, no, no, look, it, it, this... This world of indifference is actually incredibly rich yeah. for us. Yeah, yeah. But could I ask you, like, I mean, reaching out, can we reach out with current structures that we have in the church? Or are you. Oh, <laughs> we must change uh, some of the structures. But I think, first of all, we must change the mentality. Uh, because without the, uh, the spiritual deepening, uh, just the changing of the institutional structures is nothing. So uh, we uh, need uh, the new, uh, uh, for, for the new wine, uh, the new... Um, in old skin. Is, new wine in old skin. Uh, yes, mm. uh, but uh, we need also the new wine. <laughs> we need the new so wine as well, I see. <laughs> uh, so uh, I think the, uh, the changes in the institutional structures are uh, important, uh, necessary. It should be the part of the similar renewal, but without the change of mentality, it's for nothing. You know, I, I've got the experience uh, from our part of the world, for a posthumous world. Um, the Vatican II uh, was in the time when uh, in our countries, in the East and uh, Central Europe, where the communist uh, regimes. So the priests have practically no access to the new theology. And um, then without understanding this uh, intellectual background of the council, they were not able to accept it fully. So uh, for many, uh, was the uh, Vatican II uh, just uh, something formal. We were turned the altar, we changed the liturgical language, but the mentality was was the same. So without uh, studying Kraner and Bakes and Hans King and so on, uh, it was very hard to understand what is going on uh, in uh, the council. 
but there was one exemption. Uh, the people, they were mostly uh, isolated. They were in prison in the 50s and 60s. They understood it because uh, there in the prison, they exercised the spontaneous ecumenism. They were uh, in the prison with, with, yeah. with the Protestants and with, with some seekers and so on. And they dreamed in prison about a future church which will be more poor, more serving church, welcoming church, ecumenical church. So they accepted also this persecution as a sort of uh, um, purification of the church, purification from the old triumphalism. And uh, when they were released in the late 60s from prison and they uh, received the first uh, uh, informations about Vatican II. Oh, it's exactly what we were dreamed about, this ecumenical church, poor church, serving church. So those people they were most isolated. They were the pioneers of the reform of the church. They were my, 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 my fathers in my face. And I discovered the face when I was 18, and, uh, and those people were the witness uh, for me, the, the real hero. They spent so many years in prison. Uh, but uh, the majority of the church, the, 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 the priests that were in parishes, they had not so much understanding and open mind for this mentality of Vatican II. So uh, those people are also a little bit resistant to the reform uh, by Pope Francis now. Okay. All right, well, look, that's plenty to think about for us <laughs> <laughs> Australians who haven't been through that experience, Frank Brennan. How do you hear uh, Tomas's sort of general diagnosis? Well, I think one of the very appealing things in your book about the afternoon of Christianity, Thomas, if I may say, is that you hold together the tension and the paradox yeah. of it's not as if death is behind us and now resurrection is coming. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. death and resurrection are always with us. And how do we deal with the tensions and paradoxes yeah. in the real lives, particularly of young people? And mm -hmm. you've always had a yeah. particular zest for young people. And for me, in the Australian context, it's, you know, when you speak of these nuns or the knowns or whatever, it's not that they're indifferent. A lot of them mm. care very deeply about the environment, about questions of sexuality, mm. about mm. the place of women. Mm. Uh, we saw it here in last year in Australia with a big referendum. Young people all on board about recognition of the special rights and mm -hmm. entitlements of mm -hmm. the first Australians, mm -hmm. the Indigenous people. Mm -hmm. Now. Those sorts of concerns, I think that in Australia, young people or those known generally, mm. they don't think the institutional church has really got a board with those concerns. Mm. Mm. And it's as if notions of tradition and authority still lock us into set solutions to things, but where we don't wrestle mm. with these really lively moral questions, mm. which do mm. give rise to questions yeah. about yeah. paradox and do mm. create mm. the tensions. Mm. Mm. So I think for us in Australia, I mean, we were a bit surprised, I think, to find that there in Rome, they took notice of the fact that we'd had a plenary council. Now, I was one of the so-called Pariti at that council, a so-called expert, and I found it a bit of a bore, I have to say. Yeah. <laughs> but, but all of a sudden in Rome, they said, well, this is the way you do these things. And I think for us in the Australian church, it was, well, uh, we do have it within us to wrestle with these questions about tradition and authority and mm -hmm. being attentive to the lived experience of people and trying to do something to bring a greater resolution between pastoral outreach and dogmatic authoritarianism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I think for us in the Australian church, the challenge on one level continues to be that parishes can be declining havens mm -hmm. for those who are not much interested mm -hmm. in those tensions and paradoxes, yeah. and they just want the, the certainties of life and the certainties of worship. Mm -hmm. But then with our Catholic education system, which is very vast, mm -hmm. uh, there's always the engagement with those young minds who are not very churched, 
but who tend, because of Catholic social teaching, to be very switched on yeah. about questions yeah. of the environment, of yeah. sexuality, about the rights of First Nations peoples, and yeah. of course that women should have an equal place at the table. Yeah. Yeah. So I think for us in Australia, uh, those tensions and paradoxes that you've highlighted, uh, they're there, but we still have a bit the Australian thing that we know that in the church that basically it'll all be worked out in Europe and we'll be given the answers. Yes, it's interesting you say, because I didn't find that, I wasn't at the plenary all through, I reported on it and I was um, amazed by the level of commitment I saw and I knew it didn't extend into the pews, I, I, not stupid, but I thought that the there was a sense that there was a, um, only there could people work hard on what it is that the church had to, to, to provide, which wasn't politics, because some of what you're talking about is straight politics, mm. if you know what I mean. But it, there was the interior, like an a, a introspection that took you somewhere which, that nowhere else did. That is what I've always felt the church had to be able to provide. And I felt there was a lot of very good dwelling upon the paradoxes of trying to do that. Mm. And so that's what I'm intrigued by with your challenge Thomas, is that I think your big dreams are simply wonderful. Um, being a very Australian pragmatic type, mm -hmm. I say, how do we do this? Like, how do we harness this and not become just a big blamange, you know? Mm -hmm. Some sort of search that, yes, is admirable, but <laughs> does it have any sort of real guts, you know? But a uh, little bit also from this uh, conversation, I feel that the Czech Republic and Australia are uh, very distant in a geographical sense, but perhaps not so distant <laughs> uh, in this uh, mentality because we are the secular uh, country and uh, with a very strong secularization also before the communism. Uh, but uh, uh, now, I think we stand uh, in front of the very similar um, uh, challenges uh, to communicate with this uh, secular, uh, uh, secular uh, society and uh, to be on the table. So I can uh, perhaps uh, quote my um, personal uh, experience. Um, I have the academic parish in Prague and I baptized more than 3,000 adults in these 30 years after the fall of communism. I was 11 years in the underground church, uh, and but uh, after the fall of communism, I uh, found in this um, academic parish in Prague, uh, as an intellectual center, and in this most atheistic country in Europe and maybe in the world, there are uh, every, uh, every year more and more young, uh, open-minded, educated people, and they have the interest in Christianity, interest in spirituality, but uh, they need to have um, uh, different uh, um, access, different uh, way of uh, communication. So, uh, for example, uh, after the, uh, this boom of uh, interest in religion after the fall of communism, uh, um, uh, then came um, the other period and uh, people were uh, a little bit disappointed. They expected something new from the church. Magic. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and um, I was also uh, uh, disappointed because I knew from the underground church some great uh, personalities and uh, I, my imagination is the church as such is like those people. Ne? And then uh, the mentality is uh, <laughs> quite different, the average mentality of many Catholics and many priests. Uh, but uh, uh, yes, uh, and 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 and, and uh, many of these young people I baptized, they finished the study in Prague and uh, came and returned uh, to the small towns, and there uh, was a church uh, with uh, five uh, other uh, ladies and one priest. He has already. 10 years the same preaching, and uh, when, they <laughs> when they say, oh, I, I would like to, to help you, no, 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 I'm, I do everything myself, <laughs> and no, no, oh, you are from Prague and from Hali, no, no, no. <laughs> and uh, so uh, they were disappointed. They say, 
it is the church, so, so no thank you. <laughs> and uh, But now we created a, a, spiritual, a center for spiritual retreats, and there are the courses in uh, meditation, in contemplative prayer. There are some creative, uh, uh, creative uh, um, uh, retreats, uh, for example, with films. The people are yeah. uh, one week in the absolute silence, and they see twice a day very strong film. And, uh, and they should meditate about it, how it connected with my own life story, with my emotions. And uh, I think those we should work also with art and with, with literature, with films, and uh, uh, to do uh, everything to touch the life experience of, of, of people, not the so it's a more sen- from outside. Sorry to interrupt. It's like a, it's a, it's a sensuality you're tapping. Also, yes, yes, of course, because the face is not uh, something what happens in our brains. In in, in our, um, uh, it is also uh, the real face uh, is uh, is uh, uh, is connected yeah. with our thinking, with our emotions, uh, with uh, our um, decisions, and so on, with our conscience and unconscious. Mm-hmm. Uh, so um, uh, I think uh, the faith is much broader than just the doctrine. Uh, we, we, we were so uh, for 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 many years uh, focused on uh, the orthodoxy. A um, little bit about the orthopraxis, the morality, but uh, we um, we didn't uh, realize how important is this um, uh, 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 this is orthopathy. So uh, the pathos, the, uh, the 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 feeling, the the living experience, the spirituality, and without this. Is the faith just belief, just the religious conviction, but uh, religious conviction and the faith, the Christian faith, are very different uh, things. Could, uh, could I ask one of those practical Australian questions? Yes. If you were appointed as the assistant priest to that parish priest who said, no, no, I don't need yeah, any yeah. help or anything, what would you do? <laughs> Crying. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking if if I should uh, go to a revolution or <laughs> some sort, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, yes, um, if uh, the pastor is uh, uh, able to, to 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 think about it and to discuss it, so there are some way. Eh? But there are some people. They, are, they have a close mind. Eh? Would uh, there be I, any new programs or? readings that you would set up within the parish uh, community. I think so. Yeah. I think so. Yes, yes, yes. I think we should uh, put together the people they are open uh, they, they, they are able to have some open mind and open heart and to to, to discuss with them and to show them that uh, there is a place uh, where they can uh, also speak freely eh, and to, to express themselves eh, uh, and I think it's it's uh, it's important to create such of uh, such of places uh, to meditate together in silence and also to speak freely about our uh, difficulties with, mm. with, with, with faith, about our struggle with God <laughs> and, and, uh, and so on. So uh, this is the part of synodality also, né? this common way and this place for sharing our experiences that speak very freely, open about it. Né? It is something new in the and church. That doesn't I, I, I sort of frighten you, I mean, as, as a, uh, it, it, that, because a lot of people would say, oh, where will that go? You know, where will that head? Um, can, can you harness it? But your point is, don't harness it, I think. <laughs> let, it, let it go. For, 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 for many people, uh, they, uh, the church is, uh, they are members of the church, not because of the gospel, but they want to be the part of the institution uh, which is stable, which is um, in the time of so many changes, 
unchangeable, but it is the illusion. Eh? The church is uh, also all living organism is uh, changing and is in development. Uh, so uh, this traditionalism is the revolt against the tradition. Tradition is the living river of recontextualization or thinking, the, think the creative uh, reconstitution, uh, but the traditionalists, uh, they want just to stop this river and to, uh, to um, uh, 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 it is the idolatry of uh, something uh, which is um, put out of the context. Uh, and um, yes. I'm, I'm going to come to, because one of uh, Thomas's great suggestions is these, he's, he's imagining that the, the parish systems, the territorial parishes that we have around the world, that they may well have come to the end of their useful life, they're a few hundred years old, and imagines these sort of spiritual hubs, spiritual centres, which are, he's, he's referring to there. Now, I mean, I think that has a lot of um, offering. I can see that there's a lot of possibility in that. Can, can you see that? Can you see, have you seen it? Well, with respect, I can see it, but I, I think it's got to be a both and, if I might say, in that, I think, I think deep in the human heart, particularly for those of a Catholic perspective, uh, the idea of a worshipping community, where particularly at events like weddings or funerals or mm -hmm. baptisms or whatever, mm -hmm. that you've got a, a sort of structure, which is a local structure, a local community. Now, I think if you can create the hubs which complement that, mm -hmm. I think it'd be a very good yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. I think we risk throwing the baby out with the bathwater, as we would say, if you simply say, oh, well, the parish structure, you don't need it anymore, or it's reached its use by date, in that I don't think the creation of the spiritual hubs uh, will be enough to get us there mm -hmm. in terms of communal identity, communal worship. And let's be very blunt, uh, there are not too many Thomas Halix around. Mm -hmm. I mean. If every parish priest was like you, who could convene such a hub, well and good. But <laughs> like that old parish priest you're referring to, you say to him, look, we're going to abolish your parish, but you're going to convene a spiritual hub. <laughs> well, there won't be any takers. You know, what, this, this is a small thought for me. I've often thought that the tapping into the great, rich cultural tradition that Christianity represents is completely ignored by parishes. You know, like just the sheer artistry on the walls, if you know what I mean, uh, and just where this comes from, just a sense of context and a little bit of grandeur, a little bit of perspective beyond sitting there and, you know, doing a little bit of prayer, as it were. You know, I sort of feel that that is available and could be done. It is. I must say, I think the sort of aesthetics of Catholicism mm. have been enhanced a bit since COVID in this country, mm. particularly, if I may say, the sort of Zoom masses and things from cathedrals. Right. Uh, they've really, they've come out of themselves and there's been a discovery of that artistic tradition and uh, the need for an aesthetic expression of things. So I'm all for it. For me, it was the door. I, uh, 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 the, the the first attraction of Catholicism was this aesthetical. Was it? Uh, yes, yes. The, 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 the uh, architecture uh, in Prague, the architecture of, 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 of the churches, uh, it was in contrast with this grey socialist realism <laughs> and, uh, yes. the, and the spiritual How music and then, uh, then, uh, then the writers like uh, Chesterton or uh, Graham Greene and so on. It was for me the, 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 the entrance to Catholicism. And, but I would perhaps be just the aesthetical and intellectual sympathizer with the church uh, um, if I wouldn't meet uh, some um, uh, some uh, witnesses in, in, in the late so you 60s. Need witnesses as well in, as in, in, in the late right? 60s, I met the priest. They spent so many years in prison, and so the church was uh, has for me some human face. Ne? Before it was just the aesthetical, intellectual inspiration, but it's not enough. Ne? It is uh, uh, I can be the the sympathizer with the with the 
with the, with the Christianity, there are many, uh, and, and uh, for some culture, Christianity. But to be a member of the church, I need a church with some human faces. Uh, and, and <laughs> See, that's, 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 a very, that's a lovely twinning. And, and I mean, may I say that this very parish, this very diocese we're in, the beautiful new, newish now, cathedral here in Parramatta is sublime as far as I'm concerned. It is a beautiful imagined structure. It's, it's um, modern, uh, it's thoroughly um, holy. <laughs> it's a marvellously invitational thing, I think. Um, and of course, a lot of the architects who do build modern churches are professed atheists, ironically, to go back to your point, who imagine the, in, in a very, um, sub, you know, uh, sort of ap tapping into all of those quest issues, and they produce these beautiful outcomes. Yeah. Uh, the Christian arts is always connected with the uh, sort of faith. Uh, if the faith is uh, just the ideology, uh, then uh, the spiritual art is the kitsch, no? is the ideological kitsch. So it was in the time of this uh, Pius uh, the Ninth and 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 uh, and this uh, Pius uh, 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 epoch in in the, in the Christianity in the late uh, late nineteenth uh, century and the beginning of the twentieth century. This time, the architecture, it was a nostalgia for the past, neo-gothics, neo-baroque, neo-renaissance, nothing new. Also in this, uh, and neo-Thomism <laughs> and neo-scholasticism in, in philosophy and such. It was always the nostalgia for the past, and especially the past, how it uh, looks in the imagination of the romanticism. <laughs> they have the romantic vision about the Middle Age, uh, quite different than <laughs> the real Middle Age. Né? And uh, it was this nostalgia for the past, and it was visible not only in the theology, but also in the art. So the arts is way how to understand the, uh, the uh, uh, yes, the, the type, the, the style, uh, how people believe. Uh, Okay, now, final question to you both. If we imagine, um, and, and you do propose this, that we have to work out what uh, we can jettison and what we mustn't jettison, what are the, the, what are the what's the crucial, um, what we can discard and what we can't, cannot discard mm -hmm. as we move into this new stage. How would you summarize that, please? Oh, the people uh, are looking for some identity of Christianity. Eh? What is uh, what is the pillar of our identity was unchangeable, and I think uh, there are uh, nothing like that uh, because the power of our identity is the risen Christ and the Spirit. Uh, we cannot say uh, when the Pope Francis was asked, uh, "What is the goal of the synod?" Uh, renewal. Uh, <laughs> when we will stop with this <laughs> renewal, he said, "No, I don't know what is what is the goal. We are like Abraham, who was called to uh, to 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 uh, leave his country, and uh, he was so courageous and and so obedient to God that he um, uh, let him go without knowing where." is he going? So the goal is uh, open and the goal is eschatological and we cannot stop uh, on, on this way. We are, uh, uh, we are not the owners of the whole truth. Uh, we, uh, we uh, just Jesus can say, I am the truth. We are not Jesus. We are the followers of Jesus. And uh, we are the society of pilgrims, communio uh, viatorum, and uh, we are on the way. And we cannot say stop and there's a limit. Uh, uh, we need uh, the, uh, which is in the Jesuit tradition, eh, this um, art of uh, uh, distinguishing uh, the spiritual discernment, the spiritual discernment. I think it is the charisma for today, uh, because we cannot. There are so many new things in the in in in, in our culture, in our society, in our civilization. We cannot uncritically accept everything, but also we shouldn't. Uh, not 
should uh, have the uncritical refusal of everything. We need this uh, critical, uh, the, the, uh, I call this uh, the chirology, uh, the understand the kairos, understand the sign of the times. There are some um, spirit of the times, zeitgeist. Ne? Um, it is the language of this world, but there are also the sign of the times and the language of God. God is speaking to us through the events in our culture, in our world, and uh, we should listen and uh, to distinguish, and we, uh, we, we need this art of the spiritual, uh, yes, and I think there's the only, only, only way uh, we cannot just uh, uh, these are the borders, there are the limits, and so no, the spirit is, uh, and we must, uh, we must self-critically, also self-critically, uh, to follow this um, um, blowing of the of the of the spirit, and to listen what the spirit is saying to the churches. <laughs> So what's essential and what's superfluous, Frank Brennan? Well, I think for us as Christians in the Catholic tradition, um, the what's very important is tradition and authoritative teaching. But that tradition and authoritative teaching, given that we are Christians who believe that the Spirit is alive and active now, and not just in the past, and is alive and active in others, including others Christians, not Catholics, and in those who are the knowns or whatever we're talking about them. Uh, I think there's a need to jettison things in the tradition and authority which are clearly contrary to what we, as believing Christians, now discern as the signs of the times. So to give one practical example, I think we've got to jettison the ban on the ordination of women. And I think while we maintain that ban in the name of tradition and authority, I think we are missing the bus. And I think the spirit is alive and active in the community at large, particularly in the young generation. And that's where something like the synodal process is so important. And we see it at the moment with the discussion about, you know, blessings of same-sex couples. I've seen it in my parish. Some people saying, well, I mean, why does the Pope say you can just have a blessing but you can't have a formal ritual? Others saying, well, isn't this contrary to the teaching of the catechism? There's the tension and the paradox that you've highlighted, that what's essential is the respectful hub, if you like, at the local parish level where that conversation can occur and where the teaching can then develop. And so then tradition and authority can be maintained intact. Oh, just a small, just a small challenge. Um, you know, as, as you've written it, remem remembering that Jesus Christ said to St. Peter and the fishermen, go out into the deep. Mm -hmm. Cast your nets, yeah. you know, don't, don't yeah. think it's going and to be do safe. It again, eh? the Jesus came to this fisherman, they were so frustrated. They told him, we were catching all night and there's nothing. So it's a very bad, uh, bad moment for, for, the, uh, for the preaching. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> no. And those fishermen, those first disciples, they weren't even there listening to his message. No. Yeah. They were out fishing. Sure. Yeah. And he left those who'd come to listen to him and he went out into the world to those who were fishing and said, you're the ones I want. He wasn't conducting retreats with them. And they say, our nets are, are, are empty. Uh, he said, try it again. And I think this is something very important for, for, for our faith. Try it again. <laughs> there are so many frustrations in our life, in our church, and Jesus is coming and said, try it again. <laughs> it's one of the very nice things, I think, in your new book where you say that there are those who are now saying, well, yes, we believe, but we believe differently. Yeah, yeah. And it's the difference. Yeah. That's where yeah, we should yeah. be focusing. That's where the spirit yeah, is yeah, at work. Yeah, yeah. Mm. All right. Well, look, thank you both very much indeed. Uh, it's wonderful to have you visiting us. Thank you very much indeed, Monsignor Tomas. And I will look at um, Czechia a little differently having, with you <laughs> having sort of drawn that analogy with Australia. And Frank Brennan, thank you to you thank very you. much indeed. Thank you. Always good to see you, Geraldine. Well, look, I do hope that that's been rewarding for you. It certainly was for me. Um, and, uh, you know, the source, I think, of a lot of promptings for us as we head into this final year of the Synod on Synodality. So thank you for your time today. Bye-bye for now.